There are a lot of image formats out there. Which is the best for you if you're a new programmer trying to get into image editing, image processing in your programs? Let's talk about it. Welcome back everybody. I want to spend a few videos talking about images, image formats, things like that. And today I specifically want to look at which ones are going to be easiest for you if you're just getting started as a programmer and you also want to dabble a bit in image processing. So in this video I'm going to talk about one image format or well two, two related image formats that I think are particularly helpful for this case. And then in the next video we will use that information, that new knowledge to try to do some actual image processing. So let's get into it. So when when you start programming, typically you're starting working with text input and output. So this is standard in, standard out, just basically you know, you're printing text, you're reading text, that's totally normal to be expected. Maybe you get into some text files, but at some point in every young programmer's life, they start thinking about images and they're like, hey, can't I do something with image files? They're just files, right? It's just data. And that is absolutely right. So I'm here to help you with that today. And there are a lot of file formats out there. You are probably most familiar with things like JPEG and PNG. Those are really commonly used because they're small and there are publicly available libraries for interfacing with these file formats that are good. Let me know down in the comments if you want to see a video on one of those in the future. But today I'm talking to those of you that want to understand everything. You want to do everything yourself. No third party libraries for you. Yes, you have minor control issues. It's okay. I'm not here to judge. But if that's you, then I don't recommend getting started with JPEGs or PNGs because they're a bit more complicated. And if you're a brand new programmer, that can be a lot, dealing with all the complexities of the format. Instead, I recommend that you look at PPM images, which are not going to win any awards for file size. They're a bit bloated and we're going to see that in just a minute, but they are simple and that makes them really great for new programmers. So let's take a look at an example. Okay, so I have an image here of a sable antelope that I took a few years ago. Yes, it's very pretty. I do like this photo. And let's come down here and just let's yeah, let's make the text a little bigger, make it a little easier to read. But I'm just going to come down here and I'm going to convert this sable.jpg to a PPM file and I'm going to use image magic to do this. So this is just one command line tool that you can use to convert images from one format to another. So sable.jpg to sable.ppm. Okay. So now you can see I have two versions. Now, of course, uh, VS Code doesn't, uh, at least maybe there's there's probably a plugin that will uh, view PPMs, but currently it doesn't know how to view PPMs. So we'll get to that. And there really are two different kinds of PPM image. So we're going to make both. So for number two, we're going to do the exact same thing, only I'm going to say compress none. So this basically tells it to uh, use no compression whatsoever. The first one used very little compression. Oh, whoops, messed that up. What I want to do is give these two Two different names. Okay, so we have okay, so we have sable.ppm, which uses, uh, I mean, what they're calling a tiny bit of compression. It's not really compression, but we'll look at that. And sable2, which is going to use absolutely no compression. And if I come in here and open both of these in an image viewer, you can see. Okay, this looks the same. That's great. And if I open sable2, same thing. Okay, so from an image viewing standpoint, these are the same image. They're representing the same data. They just are using two different formats. And that's really what I want to focus on today is we're looking at the file format. And these really are two different formats. I want to start with Sable 2 because it's going to be a little easier to view just right here in our editor. It may look like a pretty image, but it's actually just a simple text file. And so because it's so simple, this is actually a good place to start. So you're going to see a few things here. First of all, there is a header to the file. A lot of image formats are going to have some kind of header header that is going to store metadata about the image itself. So in this case, we have P3. That tells us what format it is. It's a P3 PPM image. And then you have a new line. And then you're going to have the width of the image and the height of the image. So this is saying that our image is going to be 6,016 pixels wide and 4,000 pixels tall. And if you're brand new to this, pixels are just the little dots. So you basically an image is a big grid of dots. And so each pixel is a dot is telling us how many dots there are. Finally, the last thing in the header is this 255. This is telling us for each color value, which is going to describe how much color, or how intense the color is. This is the maximum value. So 255 is the biggest that you can go in this file. So we could change this if we wanted to have greater color depth, but today 255 will be great. So yeah, so this is the header. This is basically describing what we're about to look at. 
And then after that, all we have are rows of pixels. Okay, so this right here is a row of pixels. Each row is going to have, as we mentioned, 6,016 different pixels. So this is a very long row. If I scroll down, there are going to be 4,000 of these rows. Okay, anyway, I won't go all the way to the bottom. And each pixel is represented by three numbers. Okay, so this is a pixel right here. It's represented by three numbers that describe the color of a single dot or pixel in the image. Now these are what we call RGB values, that's red, green, blue. So 44 is how much red, 72 is how much green, and 73 is how much blue. And so yeah, so this is one dot, this is the next dot, this is the next dot, and we just go forever, rows and columns, and we just represent this big grid as a bunch of color values. Now it turns out that using text to represent color information for images, you know, storing image data this way is really bloated, right? This is not the most compact way. And so if we come down here and look at what we're dealing with here, you can see this. You can see that our JPEG, it's less than five megabytes. And our Sable 2 over here that we just looked at, it's a whopping 260 megabytes. Right, so this is a really big file, it's very bloated. This is why you don't see PPMs used on websites a lot, because just to download this thing would be just annoying, right? It'd be a major download for just about any image out there where JPEGs are much more compact. But this is super simple, and that's really where it shines. And that's the point. The P3 PPM format is probably the simplest format out there to explain, to see, to wrap your head around, to understand. It's just dirt simple. And so you're going to see it show up in a lot of beginner classes where the instructor wants to do some sort of image processing or manipulation, but doesn't want to spend two weeks explaining how the discrete cosine transform works. Yeah, that's some of the math used in JPEGs. Okay, but before I get ahead of myself, what about this other PPM format? So the one that had a little compression, whatever. You can see from looking at it that they are slightly smaller. So it's not quite 260 megabytes, but it's also still quite a bit bigger than the JPEG. Now this is what we call a P6 PPM, and it's gonna be very similar. The only real main difference is that the pixels are gonna be stored in binary format rather than text format. And so, yeah, still super simple. It's just gonna be slightly less bloated. Okay, so for this, let's... Okay, so for looking at these, let's open sable.ppm in a hex editor. Text editors aren't going to work very well because it's binary data and you might end up with characters with bytes that are not printable characters. So I'm using a hex editor. If you haven't seen hex editors, I have an old video about them that I will link down in the description. So if you haven't seen these and if it's confusing, just check that out. But it's basically just a simple tool that lets us look at binary data. So once again, you're gonna see something similar. So the header is basically, even though it's it's formatted slightly different. The header is the same as it was with the previous file. You're going to have P6, you're gonna have a new line, you're gonna have the width and the height of the image. So same information we had before, it is the same image, remember. And then we're going to have, again, the maximum color value. Okay, so this header is exactly the same for a P3 or a P6. The only thing that's different is we have P6 here at the beginning instead of P3. Okay, now that P6 tells you we are looking at binary pixel data later on, rather than if it was P3, it would be text. Now things do start looking differently once we get onto the pixel data. So that's here, this may look like just junk. So the hex editor is just showing us basically what the text representation is down here, but the binary representation over here is going to be a little more helpful. So like I said, these are no longer text, they are stored as a series of bytes. Now the number of bytes is going to depend on that max color value. So we had 255, any number, if this value right here in the header, if this value is less than 255, then each RGB, so each color value will be one byte. So a pixel will be three bytes. Now, if this 255 was something bigger, like let's say you know, it was 16,000 or 8,000 or whatever, like you, you wanted more color depth, then it would use two bytes. So then you would have each pixel being six bytes. But so for today, we're dealing with one byte per. So, so if we come in here, you can see this is basically our first pixel. It is three bytes. And so you can see the hex value right here. So 2C is the red, 48 is the green, and 49 is the blue. So that is going to describe the hex value for the color of that first pixel. And then once again, we just basically have rows of these and each row is going to be 60, 16, 6, 
2016, and then there are going to be 4,000 rows. Also, if we did have multiple bytes, if we had two bytes per color, these are stored in big endian format. That means the most significant byte is going to come first. If you're not familiar with byte order, I do have another video about byte order. I'll link down in the description. You can check that out. But yeah, so this, but yeah, so this different way, this binary representation of the data really just gives us a slightly more compact representation. Because instead of having each value being, you know, multiple characters and a space, now we basically have just one byte or the equivalent of one character per value. So yeah, so R, G, B, you're gonna have basically in the space it took to represent one three-digit number, we have now just represented all three numbers. So we get smaller files, we get, we have to use a hex editor now it's you know our text editor is not going to work for modifying these things but I actually think that this binary format is actually a little bit easier to work with so I think the p6s are a little bit easier to work with than the p3s as soon as you get over the whole binary data thing and in my next video we will do some reading writing and manipulating of these images but I hope this gives you an idea of how the ppm format works and maybe even gets you excited about how you could incorporate image processing into a future project of your own one of the things I love about this channel is that it allows me to interact with, to meet, to teach, to help people in places I've never been, in places I may never go. And I get the chance to teach people who may never have the opportunity to sit down in one of my classrooms. And so for me, that's both really fun and I also think it's powerful. I like to think that this channel does something good for the world. So if you enjoy the content, if you're finding it useful, please do help support the channel in all the usual YouTube ways. It really does make a difference. Also, if you get the opportunity, I hope you can pay it forward. Now, one way to do that is through giveinternet.org. They don't sponsor this channel, they are just friends and I really like their mission. They are a nonprofit working to try to make the world a better place, providing free technical education, access to the internet and devices to help people get access, to help students learn and become proficient in the use of technology and other just access other educational content. And these are students that otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity. So if you are looking for a way to make the world a better place, please do consider supporting them. I've got a link down in the description. All donations given through that link will be matched by another donor up to $30,000. So that is really cool. As always, I hope you learned something from this video and until next time, I'll see you later. Happy coding.